If we stop reading one another, we all will die. Our thought will die. Our culture will die. We will be lost. We can only keep humanity alive by reading one another and showing how we've been involved in this great conversation. Dr. Anika Prather taught in the Classics Department at Howard University as a full-time lecturer. She's an international speaker on the topic of the relevancy of classical studies to the black community. She is the co-author of The Black Intellectual Tradition, Reading Freedom in Classical Literature. Listen in as we discuss the history of classical education in America, why great books can heal cultural divide, and why all people should know and love the classics. Benedictine College is transforming culture in America, one conversation at a time. From our studios in Atchison, Kansas, these are The Benedictine Dialogues. All right, Dr. Prather, welcome to the Benedictine Dialogues. I really appreciate you coming here to campus for speaking with our students and our faculty. Um, I thought to get us started off, I'd, I'd ask you, have you always been into the classics? Have you always been a, a reader? I came to it very late. I mean, um, I'm, all those who get to learn it as children and major it in college are so blessed because I discovered it when my parents just decided to start a classical school in a predominantly African-American neighborhood. And at first I rejected the, no, the idea of it. But then I began to see how it was impacting the students' lives, and I wanted to become a part of it. So I came into their school to teach music and drama, and eventually started teaching the Great Books class. And then it just took off from there. I went on and got my master's in liberal arts from St. John's College, and just continued to go deeper. I changed from researching the role of the arts, because that was my original interests in, ac in the academic world was the uh, researching the role of arts in K-12 education. But after discovering this, I changed over to the relevancy of classical education in the black community. And that was my whole dissertation and everything. Yeah. I have a memory of all of us going on vacation to a Christian retreat center. And my mom in the lobby saw this tiny pamphlet that says, would you like to start a classical school? It's from um, um, the Association of Classical Christian Schools. And she did some research on classical education and she said, this is the kind of education that I want for my kids. Um, we have since, um, our um, work no longer is affiliated with the Association of Classical Christian Schools because we're really trying to reach a diverse audience and create a space that's very welcoming to all people um, to really um, embrace the classical tradition and so, and so now we're just really kind of still navigating our way through that space of recognizing the importance of this type of education, but also how do we make sure everyone can connect to it? But my parents just saw it. I, I tend to think that it's because they were, my parents are in their 80s, so they were part of the early African-American schools um, and those, desegregate, those segregated schools, and a lot of those schools were classical. So I think that they had a classical education themselves. And so when they saw the characteristics of classical education, it triggered something familiar for them. And both of my parents are very smart. My dad was a professor at Howard. My mom got her degree at Howard. Um, my mom is an educator. My dad is a dent was a dentist. He's now a pastor, or he's a retired pastor now. They're very smart, very educated people. And I think they were able to relate their human experience as children, gaining a certain type of education that helped to spur them forward. And when they saw the characteristics of classical education, it wasn't about race or anything to them. It was about this was something they had. This was something that was familiar. And if it worked for me, it must be able to work for my community. Yes. Now there's this kind of great books movement that's happening in the country. And you're even seeing governments backing, you know, like the state of Texas where I was. Um, we had kids in a founder's school, which is associated with Hillsdale. Mm -hmm. And I loved having kids there that I mean, we had Hindus there. We had yeah. Muslims there. We had predominantly Christian, I mean, it's Texas. Mm -hmm. um, but it was an interesting experience for them to experience things like Shakespeare and the like yeah. with kids that don't have the same experience. And I love that, you yes. know, for my, for my kids. And it, it really opened up a world for them that it's, this is a human story, yes. right? That's what we're talking about here. Um, so what, what are your thoughts on, on the importance or, or how significant this great books movement is for the country? So I have some statements on that that have proven sometimes controversial, but I'm going to ask that you listen to me sure. all the way through. So first of all, a lot of times when I talk about classical education and its connection to the Western canon, someone will say, well, we need to add more. It doesn't have a lot of diversity. And I agree with that, but we have to do that very carefully. And you can't, I, don't, I think we have to be careful with just randomly putting any diversity in it 
because then you miss the message that it's trying to capture, which is this, this human story that each person is referencing the other, like building blocks. Sometimes people mistake the canon or classical education is just a bunch of white people just throwing books together to leave out people of color. That's true and not true. And let me explain what I mean by that. For the time they were in, they were, con they were connecting books that told the human story and that specifically referenced the ones that came before. It wasn't just a random book list. And so if we're gonna add to the list, we need to make sure we're following that same philosophy that reveals a great conversation that spans times and continents even. If we just start adding lists, people to the list because they're brown, then we're basically just doing a list of books to read. There is something very distinct about classical education. It is a focus of study, like Italian literature or Eastern classics or African American lit. It has the same right to exist as any other, these other focus studies, right? And in my experience in academia, you have all time, I've seen people studying Eastern classics who are black. I've seen black people study Italian Renaissance literature. I've seen Asian people study African American literature. Like I've seen all these people connecting to these different human experiences, right? The Western canon is a collection of books that are capturing a human experience. Now, as much as some people may want to separate themselves from that human experience, if we do that, then we cut ourselves off from history. And there's a history associated with the Western canon that helps us understand our human experiences, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so the beauty about classical education is because it is so connected to so many of us, each of our ancestors in some way have been a part of that great conversation we learn more about ourselves by engaging with it, even the books that we disagree with. And then if we're adding to the list, we're adding those who are referencing those part of that conversation. It's, it's a whole philosophy of study that, yes, should be expanded, but there is a theory behind that expansion that we need to adhere to so we don't lose this, this narrative. And, and, and the narrative, um, if you read the books, now some people have mis misused the collection for their own white supremacy or selfish ambition. That's the hearts of people. But a lot of these books, especially those from the ancient time period, they existed before race even existed. And so the, the things they're talking about have nothing to, are not about race, they're about human experience. I'm gonna give you a perfect example. So if we talk about reading Herodotus which a bunch, with a bunch of African-American students. I know that I'm getting pushback on why are you teaching black students this Greek literature? That's not their heritage. But many people don't realize that the histories by Herodotus talk extensively about ancient African civilizations. And this Greek historian went, he actually left Greece. He went from continent, he went, into, he went from Greece, Asia, Africa, he went all around that area where he lived to learn different human experiences. And then he wrote, even the Middle East, and he wrote extensively about it. So this ancient historian wasn't plagued by the, we, don't, we wanna silence the stories of people of color. He wasn't plagued by that. He wasn't even thinking about that. He boldly proclaims the beauty of the Ethiopian people and the power and wisdom of the Ethiopian people. He boldly describes the power of, of the Middle Eastern um, civilizations that were so powerful at that time. And so when we don't read him, when we dismiss him as, oh, that's Greek, or oh, that's white, I'm not reading that, then you actually are missing a whole history on ancient African civilizations and other civilizations, Greek, Asian, everyone. And so classical education, if you base it on what is actually in the literature, a lot of it actually exposes us to other continents, yes. other ethnic groups, other people, and it shows how different people were connecting and coming together and sharing wisdom and sharing art and sharing knowledge and even fighting together in battle. Like we're missing the fact that some ancient uh, uh, diverse populations were actually participating in 
the Trojan War. Like, wouldn't you want to know that the Africans were fighting in the Trojan War? Exactly. Yeah. Like, wouldn't you want to yeah, know that? Yeah, absolutely. Wouldn't you want to know that we actually were helping because we were considered so powerful? That's part of us understanding our agency. Right now, America is plagued with only teaching about how we were enslaved. It's almost as if they feel like the story of black people began in 1619. Hmm. But when we read the classical tradition, we find out that our story began well before that. And so what you're doing, instead of dismissing it or just throwing random books in there just because they're diverse, and I'm not saying that with, in a flippant way, but I'm saying we want to be able to make sure we're adding in those stories that continue to give a full understanding of what's happening in that time period, that whole theory around it. When you do that, then you miss that story. That's why I love the term uh, conversation. Yes. Because you're conversing with people from 2,500, 5,000 years ago. Yes. And, and if you can add to that conversation, then yes, yes. That is worthy of our time and attention and study. Um, but if it's not conversing, and if it's not something that's kind of adding to the great tradition, yes. that's where the limitation is. It's yep. like, well, you're, you're not participating in what we're talking about here. Yep. Um, and a lot of people don't know that Mortimer Adler, who was yes. one of the great proponents, exactly. actually wanted a great books of the Eastern world. Yep. He, he wanted to push for one. Yep. He just didn't have time. Yep. He ran Adler out of time. Because, so. <laughs> I mean, it probably took a long time to do the canon itself. It's 40,000 hours. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I love the idea of what, when we're inviting students in, regardless of race, color, creed, yes. you're inviting them to this much bigger human yes. story that yes. speaks to all of our emotions and hopes and dreams and loves and hates and yes. all this stuff. Um, but then also these hidden histories of things that we, we have dismissed. And, and sadly, I, I didn't get a classical education growing up. I didn't know any of that yeah. until I got my PhD. Yes. And I was like, <laughs> like, that's not... We're in the same boat. <laughs> that shouldn't be where it, we're learning no, these things. Exactly. You know? um, and it, like a, a really good tangible example is um, the story of Terence the African. Hmm. He's an ro ancient Roman playwright from Ethiopia. But he came to Rome as an enslaved man. His master gave him a classical education. And he began to write these wonderful uh, Roman comedies. And they, they claim they, they are written probably in the best Latin than most people. The Latin Terence wrote with was so good that his plays were used in early American schools. Oh, my gosh. So let's just, can we just, <laughs> right? Because we're taught that. Black people didn't really contribute anything to American history, we're right. just slaves. But the early American schools, one of their main textbooks was a, was a collection of Roman plays written in Latin, and they were used to teach early Americans Latin. That's amazing. This is an African. Why wouldn't we want to know that? Exactly. So if, and, and to prove my point, um, John Adams wrote his son, John Quincy Adams, who was starting his studies, I, I want to say high school, college. And he writes his son, if you want to learn Latin, read the plays of Terence. Now this is John Adams and John Quincy Adams. Like process that for yes. a minute. These, this is the same Adams who fought for, for the, those in the Amistad, mm. right? This is the, the slave ship where the uh, enslaved people or those who were being held captive um, uh, revolted against being uh, held captive. And I think it was John Quincy Adams who was their, the lawyer and they were um, exonerated. Mm -hmm. That John Quincy Adams, his father told him to study the plays written by an ancient African to learn Latin. See, there's so much we don't know about ourselves, yes. right? That story includes your story and my story. Yes. It's the story of all of America. Right? That is a story that everyone needs to know. Absolutely. Because we all need to know how we've been a part of this human existence. Mm -hmm. And Terrence, the, again, if you, and this is again learning history, if you read the story of Terrence and who he was related to and who he was connected to, he eventually he became so, his plays that he wrote in ancient Rome became so popular that um, he um, got his freedom. He became very wealthy because he was a well-known playwright. His plays were performed amongst the royal court. And some of his closest friends were those who fought in the war, I think the war of Carthage, where um, Hannibal was overthrown. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm saying all this, and I only learned this because I'm studying the life of Terence. Yeah. 
who was part of the classics time, right? This is what all of us are missing. Yes. And who was Hannibal? He was a North African who at one point defeated the Roman Empire, yes. right? Eventually he lost again, but we need to know Africans won the wars of the West, against the West. Like, this is, this is so empowering for everyone. Number one, on my end, it empowers my community to recognize we have a history that is powerful and meaningful. But on the other side, it, it helps it helps to heal racism and white supremacy. Because then if we all learn this history, no one begins to see themselves as better than the other. Mm -hmm. Because we all see how we have all been great. We've all equally contributed to human history. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to promote, a lot of people misunderstand my thoughts, that I'm trying to promote just diversity. Mm -hmm. I use that word for lack of a better word. I'm trying to find a new word that really uh, exemplifies what I'm trying to do. But it's not just diversity. And when I actually, I think of diversity, I think of all of us. Mm -hmm. The word diversity means all of us. It doesn't mean, sometimes people mean, think diversity means let's just only hear the voices of people of color. Yes. That's not what I, that's not my definition of diversity. My definition of diversity is diversity of belief, of ethnicity, of background, of history, all being able to come together and share the human existence and see how we connect. That's diversity to me. So that means all of us. So your story is not silenced in my definition of diversity, and neither is mine. And neither is one elevated more than the other. Yes. But we look, we, we read each other's stories, we see how we're interconnected, and we learn how we equally have contributed to human progress. I mentioned to you whenever we were uh, chatting before that I'm a big Russell Kirk uh, guy. Yes. And a big part of what he talks about is you can't really know yourself and know you, unless you know your roots. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when you say this, that tells me all of our roots go so far back yes. than what we often let ourselves realize. Yes. We give ourselves about 150, 200 years worth of yes. roots. It's like, yes. you, know, you actually have like yeah. 5,000 years of yes. fruits here. Uh, and there are stories that we need to be shouting from the rooftops yes. to let you know that this goes way deeper yes. and farther back than we allow ourselves so often. Yeah. There's so much we've been missing. Mm -hmm. um, I was finishing my dissertation, and you know, when you start a journey like that, which I know you can identify, you keep saying to yourself, I just can't wait till I'm finished. Yeah. And I have a cousin, his name is um, Dr. Charles McKinney. He's the head of African American Studies at Rhodes, Rhodes College. And he said, cousin, that you're just getting started. <laughs> and I, when I finished my dissertation, I didn't feel finished because I was just beginning to understand how, like what you said, how much of a timeline I need to cover. Mm -hmm. For me, my educational experience only went back a couple hundred years, especially for, when it came to learning my own history, it didn't go back very far, right? Yeah. Um, but when I got into studying the classical tradition, oh my goodness. It's thousands of years that have not been covered. And, and this also goes beyond just the black experience, right? I'm learning about the classical tradition in India. Mm -hmm. I'm learning about the classical tradition in the Middle East, where the fact that we even have a classical tradition is because for a while this tradition was lost. And then the Muslims began to collect the works of Aristotle and others to preserve it again for us. And we have it today. And all of us are a part of that. Um, I tend to look, look at classical education as a tool to bring us together mm -hmm. through our shared humanity. Because we see our stories, diverse stories in the literature, and we see how diverse stories have connected to the literature. And that has been pervasive since the beginning of time. I love that you brought up the example of Aristotle because he influenced so much of American documents, founding yes. American documents, and most people don't know that it was yes. the Muslims that brought him back into existence. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we have the Muslims to think, think for that, yes, right? That exactly. influenced our country. Yes. Um, so tell me a little bit about That's your. That's so funny. <laughs> tell me a little bit about your uh, research into the idea of, of classics as a sort of liberation, a liberation of mind, or whatever we mean we mean by that. So when I first started my journey into classical education, I, I really just got into it because I began to see the lives of students change, their mentality, their academic ability. I began to see almost immediately a closing of the achievement gap in black communities. Um, and even I began to do some work in Latino communities as well um, before we became a virtual school. And so I first started out just a champion for this because I saw it was fixing something that was wrong. But then I, I mean, I'm so glad this is a place of faith. I believe it was God. I was laying down, my dad and mom, are, they are collectors of books. 
And I just was looking on their bookshelf. Um, I was laying down next to their, one of their bookshelves at home one day, and I saw Souls of Black Folk. Now, I grew, I grew up knowing about Du Bois and knowing about his book, Souls of Black Folk, but I had never read it. And so I decided to open it up and just see what this was all about. And it just opened up about midway through the book to this uh, essay called Of the Training of Black Men. Mm. And he was explaining the kind of education. Now, he's very patriarchal, okay? He acts like women don't exist or should only be in the kitchen, but that's a whole other conversation. But I take what he said and I apply it sure. to men and women, right? And it was called Of the Training of Black Men, and in it, he... Um, outlines the kind of education we need, which was a classical education. And then he ends this essay after all of this evidence and showing, he basically went through the history of how classical education really helped to liberate us uh, mentally and academically. And he ends the essay saying, I sit with, I'm gonna try to remember the whole thing, but he says, at the end he says, I sit with Shakespeare and he winces not. Across the color line, I go arm in arm with Balzac and Damas. And I summon Aristotle and what soul I will, and they all come graciously with no scorn nor condescension. And then when he talks about, and, and together we, we dance or glide in gilded halls, he relates his love for the classical tradition with a dance that's filled with diverse people. And again, I want to repeat what I mean by diversity. I mean diverse, diversity to me means all of us are welcome, dancing in these gilded halls, together, sharing our human experiences. No one is looking down on the other. We're all embracing one another, loving one another, uh, accepting one another, even if we're different. And Du Bois says, when I read this literature, I don't feel rejected, and I live in a world where my brown skin is rejected. But I escape to this magical place when I read the Western canon. Mm. And this magical place accepts, accepts me as I am. And when I read that passage, I want us to emulate that. And that is the purpose of classical education. There are many who have taken it and they've tried to make it about some political movement or even some uh, racial movement. And that's on both sides. I've seen black people say, we get it to be smarter than, right? Many people don't even realize that the founder of the Harlem Renaissance felt that his classical education made him better than the rest of his people. Right? We don't want that. And on the same side, we see white people and others say, you know, this is our heritage. It doesn't belong. We are the ones who discovered this and that. Rome was the greatest empire that ever was, and everything came from us. That's not correct either. What, when you really study classical education and you study the literature carefully, it is communicating that all of humanity is great. All of humanity has contributed goodness and greatness to this world. And when we teach our children that, we can learn to love ourselves and love one another. Yeah, it's funny to, to go back to Mortimer Adler, something you said just reminded me. Um, you know, he was an anti-elitist majorly when it comes yes. to yep. the great books. Yep. I mean, he absolutely wanted farmers reading Aristotle, yes. astronauts reading Shakespeare. Yep. He's like, this is for everyone. So any elitism that comes out of it, that was certainly not that, that what, what the hope of the movement uh, was. Yes. Sadly, that gets brought in a lot. Yep. And I, I think part of that was maybe the John Dewey era, that yes. there was a little bit of elitism of yep. we want to keep this education to ourselves. And something I actually learned from you was the kind of ironic switch of whenever they desegregated, the yes. fact that black students were robbed yes. of a classical education, partially because of a white supremacy. There yeah. was an actual desire to yeah. keep it away yeah. from them. I, I learned that from you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, there's a phrase I say, a lot of people say um, classical education oppresses black people, but it's actually the taking away of classical education oppressed black people. And, if, and, and I get that from just reading the autobiographies of like Frederick Douglass and Martin Luther King and um, educators like Marva Collins or Anna Julia Cooper. There's too much evidence to show that every time a person of color or a disenfranchised person, someone who feels like they're the outcast of society, when they come in contact with this literature, something changes within them, and they actually come to love themselves more. They actually experience freedom, liberation more. 
And that when it is taken from them, they are cast into some type of darkness. And that's not me trying to give credit to some people group. It's just history. This is not anything I'm making up. This is not anything I'm trying to say to cater to a certain ideology. It's just in the primary source documents. This is just coming straight from the mouths of Toni Morrison who says we all should read Oedipus. Right? This is coming from Huey P. Newton who says after reading Plato's Republic, I'm going to read, I'm going to do something to free all people. And he starts the Black Panther. This is coming from the voice of Gandhi. This is coming from the voice of Chinua Achebe. I even was on vacation in Hawaii. So I'm a little obsessed with this whole thing we're talking about, right? I know finally my husband loves me for it, but I used to get on his nerves. <laughs> because no matter where we went, <laughs> No matter where we traveled, if I met a diverse person who loved the classical tradition, <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, baby, look, they look, look, this, this is on their bookshelf. And he's like, oh God, here we go again. But I, we were in Hawaii, right? And this is, we visited the old castle where the, the last kings and queens before um, America took over that country, um, we could see their library. And I'm seeing wow. Don Quixote on the shelf. Oh my gosh. Right? The last queen was held in house arrest while Hawaii was being taken from her. And she sat in this room and read all types of literature that you can find in the Western canon. And in the Christian Western canon, which is, there's a book called the Book of Common Prayer, mm -hmm. she was reading that. Wow. In Hawaii, I went to Hawaii and found a classical tradition. Like it's everywhere, right? Yes. I I see. I've seen it in Brazil. I've seen it everywhere. And and why do we see it everywhere? Because the actual literature is saying something different than what mankind has been trying to mm -hmm. do with it. Mankind, for, through selfish and prideful motivation, have tried to take hold of it which isolates some of us from coming to it. Yes. But when you read the history and you go throughout the world and you see how so many people have been inspired by this literature, no one can claim it. No one owns it, but everyone owns it. Thank you for listening to the Benedictine Dialogues. We'll be right back to the show after this brief message. How do we navigate the seemingly competitive claims of faith and science? When it comes to creation, some people have this legitimate concern, if life evolved, does that mean God's not necessary? Dr. Ramage, if we no longer accept the ancient cosmology, how do we know anything's true anymore? Atheists and Christians alike tend to unite in seeing the Bible and science as mutually contradictory. But the Catholic Church actually thinks quite differently, that from the very beginning, God has been perceived in the things that were made. How do God and creatures work together? Uh, what is the relationship of creation, God, the history of life? And what does knowing the created world reveal about God? I'm Dr. Matthew Ramage, full professor of theology here at Benedictine College, and this is Faith and Science. To enjoy Dr. Ramage's free video series, Faith and Science Creation, be sure to visit media.benedictine.edu. And now, back to the show. The liberation of the mind is the way you get people to think for themselves. Yes. And not to, to use like the Plato's Cave example, to just look at the shadows and be okay with the shadows. Yes. They're not yes. going to be okay with that. Yes. And so, people in power would want to keep people yeah. that they want you know, in a certain type of slavery, whether physical or mental yes. or whatever it might be, away from that liberation. Yeah. Yep. And so to me, that's why the classics are so, so important, because yeah. it frees us to see the world for what it really is, yeah. you know, and to see peoples for what they really are. Yeah. Um, not based on the information that we're, we're forced or forced on our throat, but rather it's the shared living and human experience that we've yeah. talked about. And to me, that is the most freeing element. And, the, and to me, the, the absolute reason why people should be reading this stuff yes. is because it frees us from those um, biases and, and other things that we've been given 
uh, whether at our own fault or, or at the fault of others, uh, that we should all want yes. to be free yes. in, that, in that level. Yes, yes. I, I just finished watching a play um, called Tempestuous Elements, and it tells the story of Anna Julia Cooper. And the playwright does a masterful job of showing why Anna Julia Cooper felt like classical education was so important. I mean, Anna Julia Cooper thought classical education was so important that she sacrificed her job. Mm. Like she, when, when seg desegregation began to happen and white people began to be in control of black education, she was told that she could not teach black people classically, that they only wanted Booker T's industrial education. And whites and blacks, Booker T. Washington included, all were against her and her efforts. She was a principal of the M Street School, first black principal in DC, and she was teaching classically. And all of her students were getting into places like Harvard, Princeton, and these were black students. And they were all learning Latin and Greek and reading it in those languages and doing logic and just having the whole classical education experience. And the, the white superintendent wanted her to stop. He goes to visit her in her school and he sees how brilliant her students are. And at the end of watching all of these students, he says, you're gonna have to cut this out hmm. because your students are outperforming the white students. Like, can we sit with that for a minute? That's a whole report was written uh, by a man, it was a priest from France who had come to visit to see American schools and he stopped by the M Street School and he wrote a report and said, the students, these are black students, of the M Street School are by far the smartest students in America. And that report was, was released universally, uh, internationally. And after that, the Board of Education came down so hard on Anna Julia Cooper that the superintendent, a white man, went to her and said, your students are not meant to be this smart. And she's saying, but they are this smart. He said, but, this, but we can't allow this. They're, out, they're, being, they're performing better than the white students, so they must do an industrial education. She refused, and she was fired. Wow. And she was never principal again. And some people asked, and they, she had some friends that wondered why she wouldn't just go along with that. They kept arguing with her to just, you know, you're doing too much, like just so you can keep your job. But she knew what was true, right? She was an enslaved girl herself. And she saw how classical education liberated her mind and her whole soul. And so when she was given this, this ultimatum to stop teaching classically, or teach the industrial education and keep your job. She chose to keep teaching classically for as long as she could until they immediately had, they eventually had her removed from the school system. And it was a, that point in the play is very sad because she understood something. She knew that this would be the only way our people would be really liberated. See, we think slavery ended in 1865. But another form of slavery was implemented after that, and it has been through K-12 education. And all of us who are arguing against, I don't know, I'm getting emotional when I think about it. All of us who are arguing against the classical tradition being given to every single child in America are actually participating in the oppression of people of color. And that sometimes you see in my community when they misunderstand, they think that when we say classical education, that we're trying to give students a white education. But this is the education of the free man. This is a liberated education. And I know some people have stopped saying classical and they're saying a liberal arts education. Those are sometimes synonymous. Even Du Bois would use them synonymously. But this is the education for all of us. It liberates all of us. And so I, I keep having this conversation with the hopes that someone will hear what I'm saying and understand the importance of providing a liberal arts or classical education and bringing whatever your human experience is into conversation with it. Absolutely. I mean, gosh, that's a very powerful statement. And, and honestly, that's an American hero, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that, that is, we should be shouting to, at, at the rooftops of, yeah. look at this beautiful woman who, yes. who fought for her people yes. in this way yes. and was almost martyred for it in, yes. in, a, in, a, big, in a big way. Yep. Um, that story needs to be known, yes. you know. Um, and I think there's a lot more like that too. Yeah. A lot of stories uh, like that. Um, 
So I think now, um, I guess the big question is, you know, we've got just major cultural healing yes. that needs to happen. Yes. A lot, a lot of healing. And personally, I think the great books have a big role uh, yep. to play with, with in that. What do you think? So I'm going to say something. I'm going to probably lose all my friends. <laughs> There's a phrase that they say, I'm probably going to be uninvited to the cookout when I say <laughs> this. It is the answer. And I know that's a hard saying. It took a long time for me to even come to admit that, right? Realizing that by saying that, that's going to make people frustrated. But I asked, when I was teaching in the classics department at Howard, I, teach, I taught a class. I hope I get to teach that class one day somewhere. I taught a class called um, Blacks in Classics. And I start them off in ancient Africa, and we go all the way up to modern times, reading, um, even showing how this uh, bell hooks was inf influenced by the classical tradition. So, um, African uh, black uh, activist and author. And I um, ask a question at the end of the semester. Now that we've gone through this journey of showing how the classical tradition is just so pervasive in the black community from Africa into America do we still need to read the classical tradition? And I usually get half and half. Some students will say, no, because now we have our literature. We can just read their stuff and, and we'll have enough. And so then I ask another question. If you know, we verify this, because it's kind of like the class is kind of like, um, instead of reading whole books because it's not a lot of time, I pull excerpts from just about every single piece of African-American lit. And we look at it and then we cross-reference it with whatever uh, text that person was referencing from the Western canon. So they're reading bits of the Western canon and bits of African-American literature, right, to show how they go. So for example, if we're reading Raisin in the Sun and there's a line in there where someone calls another person Prometheus, then we'll read a, a little bit of Prometheus Bound so they can see why would they call a person Prometheus, what was that all about? So that's kind of how I teach the classical tradition, right? So I asked them though, and they said, no, we don't, we could just read our own literature because we can get it through there. And then I asked them, my next question is, is if you don't read the classical tradition, or if no one reads the classical tradition, do any of you all really understand what these people are saying? Because if you don't read what they're referencing, how do you know what your own ancestors are saying? <laughs> like, that's so important. Yes. And, and when I say that, they're like, oh my goodness, you're so right. I, I hadn't thought about that. And I'm saying, if we stop reading one another, we all will die. Our thought will die. Our culture will die. We will be lost. We can only keep humanity alive by reading one another and showing how we've been involved in this great conversation throughout time, continents, and ethnicities. But well, I want to switch gears just a little bit. I know you also have a, a background in, in music. Mm -hmm. So accomplished songwriter and, and um, musician. How did you get into that? Or was that uh... <laughs> well, that was my first love. I mean, I came yeah. into the arts. for I was born into that My whole, both on both sides. My mom and dad's side, we, there's lots of musicians on both okay. sides. Like, we're one of those families, no matter what side you go to, if you go to a family reunion, we're all gathering around and forming a band and oh, singing at the great. cookout. Yeah, that's great. Like, that's... That's the, that's the life I, I was raised in. And so from that, um, like I, like I have an uncle, he's passed away now, who had a big church in California. And we always had our family reunions out there. And we'd go to church on that Sunday. And I would just go to church, and he would, my brother sings too. He would say, Dwayne, Nika, come on up here and sing a song. Like, it's kind of one of those, that's yeah. where I grew up in. So I've been singing my whole life. And I've been, and our church had a really vibrant youth drama ministry. So I was very much involved with that. And then I led drama groups after school and I became a public school teacher. So I have been living the life of the arts for most of my life. And I'm still very much steeped into the arts, but it's just become more of a hobby and personal enjoyment than sure. my career life. Um, and so that was what I was planning to be, was an artist. Um, and, I, and I'm back and forth between the visual and performing yeah. arts. And uh, so that's just my life. Music is my life. Um, I sing all the time. All three of my children are musicians. They all sing. Um, they all love the arts. They all are creative. We have art studios in our house where we're always painting and creating and making something. So art is my life. Yeah. Classical education and education and history, that is my career. Yeah. 
Every now and then, I blend the two. Yeah. So, so a lot of times when I present, which you may see today when I present later, um, when I present, I incorporate some type of dramatic or musical, I include mm -hmm. the arts in my, it's like a one woman show. A lot of times people say, do you need PowerPoint? I don't use PowerPoint. Yeah. I'm a one woman show. But I use the arts to tell this story. Well, I love when, if you call, if you want to call great books high culture, I tend not to call it that. But if you have, you know, this this higher idea of, of culture and pop culture, when the two come together and they're influencing each other, yes. I think that's an amazing way yes. to influence the larger culture yes. it, itself. And I think also it, for our listeners and stuff that want to influence culture, you know, if you're a musician, you're an artist, you're a creative in any way, to read the great books, to, to combine the two, yes. I mean, you're going to be that much better of a poet, yes. that much better of, yes. of an artist. You're going to have this great wealth of information and knowledge and beauty yes. that you can pull from that makes the great artists. Yes. You know, I think that's where it comes from. I mean, the arts reflect often the Western tradition so much. Mm -hmm. it, 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 the arts really complete the story, you yes, know? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So last question, I know you're a woman of faith, and um, how does faith kind of influence, or how, how does it play a part in a big part of what we've been talking about? My biggest thing is because God is truth, mm. and this is why Anna Julia Cooper was also a woman of faith, and I really feel like a big part of, and she wrote, she wrote about it in one of her essays, um, one reason why she wouldn't stop fighting for this, even at the risk of her own career and life, is because it was true. So I am unable to be quiet about something that is true. And so if I don't do that, then I'm lying. And if I represent God, who's supposed to be the embodiment of truth, then I must stand on truth. The other part of my faith that uh, uh, really feeds or... Um, yeah, feeds what I do, is this notion of um, Christian unity. Yes. Like we know that we know that the world, everyone's not going to always get along. But I do want to say, people who believe in the Lord, we should be striving for unity. Yes. So one of the things that does break my heart in this whole classical education fight is the disunity I see. And uh, I remember when I first started doing this, there were a group of Christians. I felt like uh, Martin Luther King and letter from the Birmingham jail. <laughs> there were a group of Christians that wrote these blog posts and were having these conversations about how my voice is a danger to the classical education movement because of my focus on diversity. And there's a misunderstanding. I'm not focusing on diversity of just certain people of color. I'm saying we all should be there. And we should all be able to feel welcome there. We should all be able to bring our life experience into conversation with this experience. And when I say that, it reminds me of Jesus. When he called the disciples, he did not choose an elitist methodology. I mean, he chose a tax collector. He chose the fishermen. He chose Mary Magdalene, who... You know, in the Bible, she's not listed as a disciple, but, you know, technically she was a disciple. She was definitely an outcast. When I think about the birth of Christ, the first people he invited to the manger scene were the shepherds, which were considered the outcasts of society. But then he also had the three kings. You know, I often say, literally, Jesus welcomed everyone into his space. If he let Judas walk with him, knowing he was going to betray him, he welcomed everyone into the space. The, the Pharisees, who were his like, arch enemy, right? He, that's how Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea came to follow him after his passing, was because he had welcomed them to engage in conversation with him. So that's my model. Jesus is actually my model. And that model applies to secular and Christian spaces. That my heart is the heart of Christ. I just want to do whatever is necessary to show that everyone is welcome. And when I say that, I really mean everyone, no matter who you are or where you're from, because Jesus died for the world. Jesus welcomes all of us. And so classical education, because it's such a universal body of knowledge, it's a great tool for living out that way that Jesus was. 
because we can invite everyone to this literature and see these human experiences and even see the different parts of the globe that are represented there and even see how different people all over the world have connected there. And it gives us something that we can offer the world that says, hey, you're welcome here. Dr. Pyro, thank you so much. This has been, I could talk to you all day. So <laughs> I really appreciate you coming and thank you for all your work. Thank you for everything you're doing. It, it really is an inspiration. Um, so just keep going. Thank you, you. Got, you, got, you got somebody with your back. So. Thank you. And for everyone listening and, and watching, I really appreciate you. Uh, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and be sure to check out media.benedictin.edu to see more of our content. Thank you for watching. God bless. We hope you enjoyed the Benedictine Dialogues, a production of Benedictine College in Atchison, Kansas. To catch all the latest and support our growing platform, visit media.benedictine.edu. And be sure to recommend this show to your friends and family. Help us to transform culture in America, one conversation at a time.